Statistics, standard error, estimated standard deviation of X bar correction factor. Get ready and some coffee because it's time to get realistic with statistics. You're not first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us, but, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section. 1925 standard error, estimated standard deviation of X bar correction factor tab, breaking out the components of this formula, calculating the standard deviation of X bar which we will explain in more detail shortly, but basically we can view it as having two halves. We're focused on the second half, which we're gonna call the correction factor part of the formula. Oftentimes we can drop off the correction factor, which is nice because then we can visualize a much more easy formula. We would like here to get an intuitive understanding of when and why we can drop off the correction factor. So let's first get an idea of what we did in a prior presentation to get this formula into context and then we'll focus on it specifically. So for that, I'm gonna jump back to a prior tab and looking at a statistical situation where we have a typical situation of, we have some population of data, it's fairly large. We can't test every item within that population to look at the characteristics of it. Therefore, we're gonna take a sample of the population, test the sample, hoping that we can apply the results we found from the sample to the larger population. Now, typically there's two ways that we can do this, one being hypothesis testing, the second being confidence intervals. Hypothesis testing typically lending itself to situations where we know what that middle point is. So something like we'd have a bag of peanuts and we're trying to see how many peanuts are in it and we already know what the average is supposed to be, for example, and then we test a bunch of bag of peanuts to see if the results we get are further enough away from our hypothesis for us to reject the original hypothesis. And therefore, you can think of, in essence, our bell curve that we would make around the hypothesis, and then our test is gonna be somewhere to the left or the right of it, and we wanna see if it gives us enough evidence to reject the original hypothesis. In a confidence interval situation, that lends itself to problems where we don't know what the middle point is, and we're gonna basically take the sample and hope that that tends towards the middle point. Now, you can kind of imagine this as a hypothesis test still, because you can basically say, well, I'm just gonna hypothesize even though I don't know everything around what I found in the sample. For example, if this is what I found in the sample, I can ask, what if, this was the actual mean of the population and build my bell curve around it where the peak of the bell curve would be here the tail would be over here asking the question that if that was the the middle point would my sample be further enough away to reject it and we can ask that for all the points from here to here for example and then we can make a confidence interval uh, that would be like peak to peak for example but what we would typically like to do is try to make the curve around what we found in the sample. So in that case, we might want to, what we would like to be able to do is say, hey, this is the middle point that we found in the sample. Could I make a confidence interval basically around it, possibly with the use of a normal distribution, or if not, possibly with T distributions, which we'll talk about more in future presentations. Now, one of the issues with this is like, if I have my data over here, then, this is a small population of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
So oftentimes you have a very large population and we couldn't test every item within the population. This population data might tend towards a bell-shaped curve, such as would be the case with heights or weights or the length of a worm or something like that. Uh, but it might not. It might have a normal. Uh, a, it might not have a normal distribution. It might have a uniform distribution, like rolling dice or something like that. It might be skewed to the left. Uh, it might be skewed to the right. What we'd like to be able to use is that bell shape, however, because the bell shape has certain characteristics to it. We know the area under the curve and so on at certain points of it. It's uniformly shaped and it's easy to define with two numbers one being the middle point, the mean or the average, and two, the spread, that being the standard deviation. So the central limit theorem will, will say that uh, it, the, it will tend towards a bell-shaped curve if we were to take multiple different samples. And the idea here being that what if we took all possible samples of whatever sample size that we're using and then we took the average of all those, and then we took the average, uh, the, the, basically the standard deviation of the mean of the means. That data then would tend towards a bell-shaped curve. So that's our general insight. Now, note, in order to think about that, when we, when we have our population data, I can imagine the actual mean of the population Although oftentimes I don't know what that is for sure because I can't test everything. That's why we're taking the sample. You can also imagine once we take the sample, in this case, we took samples of three. So we took samples of three. Here's our three numbers. We can take the mean of a sample. The mean of the sample is not likely to be exactly the mean of the population, but it's tending towards that mean. And then we can imagine what if we took all possible samples, in this case, we had sample size of just three. What if we took every combination of sample size three, in this case of a very small population of only seven, which allows us to basically do that, and we took the mean of each of those three samples, so this is the three added up divided by three, and we took the average of all of those. So this then is the data that we're looking at, and if I take the mean of the means, then if I had all possible samples, then that would come out to the exact same mean number of the actual population. So that's kind of what we proved last time. So the mean, however, is somewhat intuitive. It's the standard deviation that becomes a problem. And we have the same thing. We've got the standard deviation of the population, which sometimes we might know or sometimes we don't know in the problem. We also could have the standard deviation of one sample in this case of three, which might tend towards the standard deviation of the population, but may not be what we're looking at because we're because the population data might not have a bell-shaped curve. What we would like to have is the standard deviation of this, all of the means, as though we took every combination of sample of three. So we actually did that last time with this very small population and sample sizes to, to prove what that is. That's what we're looking for. And we're then going to approximate that in future problems when we can't take every combination of samples with this formula. So what they've done is they've, they've looked at this, they've looked at the, the relationships, and they've been able to make a formula, which is basically the standard deviation of the population, which is these numbers up here, the seven po full population divided by the square root of the sample, which in our case was three. That was the sample size. And then, so then the question is, they had to tack on this correction factor. And the question then is, when does the correction factor have to come into play? Now, there's a couple things to, to kind of keep in mind that some are kind of intuitive or possibly uh, counterintuitive sometimes. Obviously, if we have a larger sample size, the idea would be that you would think that would be good, right? And it usually is good to have a, a larger sample size is typically better than a smaller sample size, but it's not exactly a one-to-one -one relationship as to if the sample size gets larger uh, up to a certain point, it might not be adding a whole lot of more information about our confidence level that we're getting from the sample. And the analogy to that is something like a soup. Like, so if you have a pot of soup and you have one can of soup and you want to see how salty it is, you stir up the soup you take a little teaspoon of soup and you taste it, 
and that's enough to tell you how salty the soup is. And if you had a whole gallon of soup that you're going to feed an entire room, uh, a, a huge auditory room or whatever of people, then again, you would take that entire cauldron, mix it up and taste one teaspoon and you wouldn't you have to taste like a gallon of soup, right? You could take the teaspoon and still see how salty it is. And that's similar idea with our sample sizes. So that's one thing to keep in mind. It's not like we can just keep increasing the sample and the confidence is gonna be more confident in a one-to-one -one relationship with basically uh, the sample size. The other thing to keep in mind is, well, if the actual numbers here are not in a bell shape, we have to have the sample that's going to be large enough so that the central limit theorem will take effect so that if I was to imagine the mean of all of possible combinations of samples, that that will tend towards a bell-shaped curve. So again, here, a larger sample would be better, uh, but once we get to a certain point, then then the data is going to tend towards the bell-shaped curve. It's usually like, you know, 30 to 50, like under 100, basically. It's going to tend towards like a bell-shaped curve. And then the third thing we want to think about is, so those are two intuitive things in that the sample size being larger is better, but but it's not what we would kind of imagine that it would be better on a one-to-one -one kind of relationship as we increase sample size, both in terms of the central limit theorem and in terms of uh, more like confidence as, the, as we increase sample size. The third thing is, well, what about this second bit of the, of the, of the formula, which we're gonna call the correction factor? Now, as uh, the, the population here becomes important, big N, as big N gets large, which it often is, in this case, we only have seven items, but oftentimes the population is very large. And that means that little N compared to the population is gonna be fairly small. So in most scenarios, that is the case, and that's when you can drop the second bit out. So that seems a little counterintuitive because you might think, well, if little n, the sample was larger, that would be good. But in this case, if little n was very large compared to big n, that's when we have to use this correction factor. So that seems kind of counterintuitive, but that's, that's the way it is. Usually you don't need the correction factor because the formula is constructed for scenarios, which is the typical scenario where the population is quite large and therefore we're not gonna be able to pick a sample that's gonna be close to the population. So anytime we're talking about a very large population, you probably can drop off the correction factor and we have a more simple formula over here. Now remember that this formula is, what is this formula? Standard deviation. That's the standard deviation of the population. Sometimes we don't know what that is. So where do we get, what, do we, what if we don't know what that is? Well, then we might take the standard deviation of the sample. So when we take the sample, this standard deviation, in this case of three, might then tend towards the standard deviation of the population. So then we, can, we might, in some cases, replace that. We'll talk more about that in future presentations. And then remember that standard deviation is different than this standard deviation of X bar, which is what the formula is trying to estimate, which is once again, kind of like the standard deviation of the mean of all possible combinations of whatever sample size we picked, in this case, sample size of three, right? And that's gonna be then the idea, that's what the formula is doing, divided by the square root of little n, and little n is gonna stand for the sample size. In this case, the sample size was three. All right, so in this case, the sample, the, the sample and the population, big n was very small, seven numbers, therefore we would need this second bit. Let's break that out over here and a little bit more detail. So we have the standard, de uh, the, the, the standard deviation of the population. We're gonna imagine for our example here is 190 and then N, which is the sample size is 150. So let's imagine populations uh, of N and let's imagine we had a larger population, 400,000, 150, 25. This is not the sample size. This is not what we're testing. We're only testing 250 out of starting 400,000, 150, 25,000, 10,000, and then 3,000. Now you would imagine that when N is large, then we can probably drop off the correction factor because the relationship between little N and big N 
will be such that we can drop it off. So that's usually the case. Usually you can just say, how big is big N? And if it's big, then we're, we're probably gonna be able to drop it off because little n's not gonna be close to it. So, but our, our official test is little n, the sample size divided by big N, population size, is that greater than 5%? So in this case, if we do the calculations here, we're just saying, all right, well, little n is 190 over uh, big N, 400,000. So little n is small compared to big N. So if I move the decimal two places over, it's much less than 5%. So, so that means that we can drop off the second bit. So that's normally the case. So, and so here we got 150, so 250 over 150. So whatever 250 over 150,000 is less than, than 0.05, it's 0.16. Therefore we can drop off the correction factor, 25,000 population is getting smaller, still way under 5%. And even with 10,000, 250 over 10,000, the population is still quite large. But if it was 3,000, now N population is pretty small. And that the only way we're going to get a sample size that's close to the population is if it's pretty small, usually, right? So now you got 250 over 3,000. And that's when you'd have to possibly add the correction factor because this came out to be, if I move the decimal two places over, over 5%, it's at 8.3%. All right, so, so normally you might not be able to need the correction factor oftentimes. All right, so that's the, that's, now this is this formula in Excel. So we're just giving, we're saying, give me a logic test. Is this cell greater than 5%? That's all you have to type in. And Excel will say false, 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 false. And then this one is true. And when it is true, that's when we have to use the correction factor. All right. And so this is going to be the standard error calculation. So I'm going to call this first half then the standard, the standard error. Now, when we hear the term standard error, remember this is given by Sigma, which usually represents the standard deviation. So now like in, in symbols and whatnot, what are we talking about here? We got the standard deviation of the population, which is going to be Sigma, possibly Sigma of P, right? Or something like that. Uh, and that could be known or it might not be known if it's not known then we're going to have the standard deviation of one sample, the sample that we took, which you could have a sigma with an S, a sub S, or possibly just an S representing that, which should tend towards the, the standard deviation of the population. And then you got the sigma of X bar, which is what this formula is trying to represent. And that is our imaginary scenario we looked at before, where we're trying to use the central limit theorem asking the question, well, what if, in this case, I took every possible sample of, in this case, sample size 250 out of the population of, in this case, 3,000, 10,000, 25,000, and so on. That's what this formula is getting at. Then we took the average of all the averages, and then we took the standard deviation of all of that. Obviously, we can't actually do that normally, but that's what this formula is kind of estimating. So those three standard deviations we want to keep in mind the differences. We're going to call this one then, this kind of standard deviation from the formula, right, is going to be called the standard error. So notice that it comes out to 12.02, which is just going to be the, the sigma over the square root of n. So I won't calculate it with it. It's a little messy to calculate in the calculator, but it's just going to be the sigma, which is going to be the 190 divided by the square root of n and n is little n is 250. Notice that it comes out to 12.02 no matter what. So notice what is not in the standard error uh, calculation. It's not dependent on the sample on, on the population size. There's no big N in it. So it's not dependent on the sample size. It comes out the same whether the sample size is 400,000 or down to 3,000. And then we have the correction factor. So the correction factor, again, I won't calculate it because it's a little tedious to do in a calculator, but it's gonna be the square root of big N population 400,000 minus little n, which is the 250. That's the relationship between the population and the sample size divided by big N 400,000 for this top one minus one. So the square root of that.
Now notice what happens if I do that for a fairly large sample size. It comes out to something close to one. Now, if it comes out something close to one, this bit, this side over here came out to 12.02, and then we're gonna multiply it times the correction factor. If the correction factor is one, then whatever this comes out to will just be the same number. So this came out to 12.02. If big N is large, we could still calculate the correction factor, but we're gonna get a number that's darn near one. And therefore the correction factor is not gonna do anything, resulting in us getting, in essence, the same, the same number, right? So if I multiply this times this, I get 12.01 which is pretty close to 12.02. It's not doing anything, which is why we can drop it off. Whereas this one, same thing, we have the correction factor of, of uh, 150 minus 250 over uh, 150 minus one, the square root of that comes out to something pretty close to one still. So if I multiply this times this, 12.02 times 0 0.9992, I still come up with a very small adjustment to the standard error. Similarly, if we do it here, now we've got the big N is 25,000 minus little n 250 over big N 25,000 minus one, the square root of all that is still pretty close to one. So now if I multiply 12.02 times 0.995, I get to 11.96, which again, isn't much of an adjustment. Similarly here, if we take the 10,000 here minus the 250 over the 10,000 minus one square root of that, we're getting a little bit uh, less than one. And so that brought it down from 12.02 times the 0.9875 gives us the 11. 0.87 and then this one at 3000 if i plug 3000 into here minus the 250 over 3000 minus 1 the square root of that comes out to po to only 0.9576 so that's why it's actually kind of doing something down here so we come out to uh 12.02 12.02 times 0.9576 gives us about 1151 right so that's why that's going to be the idea of this so the bottom line is normally you, you you might not need the second bit because oftentimes you're dealing with situations where the n big the population is relatively large and therefore the sample is going to be relatively small compared to the population because little n over the big n will be relatively small so you can drop off the correction factor but if you're working with fairly small populations, big N is small, it's likely that you might have a fairly large sample size compared to it and therefore would have to add the correction factor. So remember a couple things to keep in mind here. The, the, the one, one thing is, is sample size going up good? Yeah, it usually is because it's gonna give you more confidence, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's kind of like that tasting of the soup that once you hit a certain level, then the level of confidence that you're going up isn't going up so much just like downing a gallon of soup isn't going to give you a better idea of how much salt is in the is in the entire kettle of soup right per portion per serving in other words and then also if sample size goes up how high does it need to go up for the central limit theorem to kick in so that it'll tend towards a bell-shaped curve when we take the mean of the means and again bigger samples would be better but once you get past a certain point then it's it's already then you should be good that we, because the central limit theorem should have kicked in and you should be in a bell-shaped curve and then how big this one's seeming a little counterintuitive because it's kind of going the other way is a sample size better for this formula well a sample size if the sample size is too large compared to the population then you're going to have to add on a second bit which is going to be this correction factor but so that seems a little counterintuitive right because you would think but the normal case is that big n would be large and therefore you wouldn't need the correction factor uh, but when the population is smaller then you might need it and also just remember the differences between the standard deviations so we're talking standard deviation of the population in this case 400,000 150 25,000
but that might not be what we're looking for if we're trying to use the central limit theorem because this might not be data that has a bell-shaped curve. We could take the standard deviation of the sample, in this case a sample of 250, which should tend towards the standard deviation of the population, but again, might not be what we're looking for because the population data might not be bell-shaped. Therefore, we would like to kick in the central limit theorem by thinking of all possible samples of, in this case, what we picked, 250 of the size of the sample, of population size, 400, 150, 25, approximating that with a formula, which kind of hopefully we have an intuitive understanding of what that means now, which we're going to call standard deviation of X bar, and that's where we get standard deviation of the population, which we may or may not know. If we don't know, we take the standard deviation of possibly a sample divided by the square root of N. And then do we have to add the correction factor?